Okay, so in this lecture, uh, we're now going to start talking about neural networks. And I know some of you have been waiting for a long time for this. Uh, but okay, it's just going to be a brief introduction. And we're going to have several lectures uh, on neural networks. And now we're going to talk mostly about a very, very early type of neural network known as the perceptron. So the perceptron is, in fact, um, a, a very simple um, neural network with no hidden layers and then it produces if we're using the thresholding activation function a linear separator for classification so so this was um, uh, an important early type of, of neural network and then um, later on this got generalized and then we're going to see over the course of several lectures uh, how to deal with these more complex forms of neural networks okay so yeah, so for today, we talk about perceptron and also supervised techniques for neural networks and more specifically for the perceptron. Um, okay, so the idea behind the perceptron in neural networks is that we can think of our computer as perhaps something that can be used to emulate uh, some of the uh, things that the brain does, right? So very early on, uh, if we go back many decades, um, researchers already had this idea that the computer could be as powerful as the brain and now the interesting question is is it possible to structure the computation in a computer to be essentially similar or the same as what the, the brain does and, and then so in this quest maybe we need to really design an architecture for our computation that could mimic the architecture of the brain. Okay so the brain um, is made up of um, an important class of cells that are known as neurons and then so um, early on um, neural networks were designed in such a way where there are computation units that correspond or at least try to mimic some of the properties that neurons have. So okay this course is not about biology uh, but and, and I'm not an expert in biology but here's a, a picture of a neuron and then what's interesting is that we have um, uh, the nucleus here, uh, but then there's also an axon and then some synapses that are responsible for uh, receiving some chemical signals and then propagating them to the main part, so the nucleus of the neuron. Now in here, um, the neuron might be activated, it might fire, and then when it fires, it will send another chemical signal through its dendrites and, and these dendrites would be connected to other neurons, to the synapses of other neurons. Okay, so, so the idea is that in the brain, at a very, very basic level, right, so there are chemical signals that propagate through neurons and they essentially go from the synapses to the dendrites and, and, and then to the next neurons and, and, and so on. Okay, so now let's make a a brief comparison between uh, some of the things that we know about the brain and also how computers are, are designed today. So for the brain, we have a, a network of neurons and now in comparison, you take any computer, it's really a network of gates, right? So we have logic gates that are essentially the basis for everything that is computed in, in a computer. Now, for the brain, we have some nerve signals that correspond often to, to chemical signals that will travel in the network of, of neurons. In comparison for the computer, we have electrical signals that are directed by the different gates, and this is what we're using essentially to do computation. Now, in the brain, um, the signals are propagated in a way where um, generally speaking, the computation is parallel, so this is quite interesting. Now for a computer, historically we've had computers that were mostly doing sequential computation. Today we have distributed systems, we also have GPUs where a lot of the computation can be parallelized, but historically it was mostly sequential, and I mean a large part of, of how things are computed in a computer are still done sequentially with, with the CPU. Um, but yeah, in, in comparison, the brain is, is mostly parallel. Now, another big difference is that um, the brain is quite robust. The reality is that every day you have some neurons, some cells in your brain that die, 
and you don't realize it. You know, you, you, you get up one morning, there goes one cell, and then you brush your teeth, there goes another cell, but you keep on functioning and, and life is good, right? So there's no problem. Um, in comparison, if we look at computers, they're quite fragile, and then if one gate stops working, this could be critical. Uh, here, architectures have been improving, but I mean, it's, it's quite common still that uh, sometimes a computer will crash. We don't know exactly what has happened, but basically, if there's one part of the computer, one gate, that really stops working, it, it, it could just be disastrous. Uh, so this is something where there's still a lot of research being done, uh, but that's an important difference, and, and we, we still don't know really how to organize things such that we could um, uh, have the same level of robustness. That being said, with, with neural networks, we now have ways of computing where um, it is possible to just delete some neurons. In fact, there are techniques for regularization in neural networks that do precisely that. They kill neurons in, in the neural network. And then the idea is that you can make the computation more robust uh, by forcing the network to adapt despite the fact that it might get mutilated. And, and then this is uh, some, some technique that is not quite popular today. Okay, so generally speaking, the idea is that now with neural networks, we are trying to mimic how the brain is organized and, and how um, at least chemical signals will propagate. And um, uh, there, there's obviously a lot of differences between true biological neural networks and, and then the artificial neural networks, but still the inspiration was from, from this, uh, what we know of, of, of the brain. Um, okay, so in general, so we, we have a network, and now you might ask, well, in our artificial neural network, what, what are going to be the nodes, what are going to be the edges? So the nodes, we're going to call them units, and they're going to correspond more or less to the neurons in a real neural network, and then the links are going to correspond more or less to synapses. The idea is that we're going to um, compute numbers uh, these are going to lead to numerical signals that are going to be transmitted between the nodes. And, and then this is more or less the same as the chemical signals that are propagated by neurons. Okay. Yes? Okay, yeah. How's the speed of uh, the electrical signal versus the chemical signal in neurons? Uh, the truth is I'm, I'm not an expert in that field. I do not know. <laughs> Uh, that, that's a great question. Uh, so people in neuroscience would, would know this, this uh, answer. Um, and um, obviously for us, if we can make the computation faster, this will be better. Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure for, for the brain um, how fast these things happen. OK. Um, now, in in a real neural network, um, the chemical signals, they propagate in a way where um, they will activate some neurons, and then when a neuron gets act activated, it will fire. And here the idea is that the chemical signal, you see, can activate a neuron in such a way where then when it fires, it will generate a new chemical signal that is transmitted to the next neurons that it's connected with. So, so now we can emulate something similar when we do computation by having a numerical signal, so that's essentially an, a number, and then we could say, well, if the number is high, perhaps this could lead to some form of activation, and then as a result, then the output could be a new numerical signal, and, and then if there's some firing, perhaps the numerical signal could also be high. Uh, so we're going to see that um, in, in general, what we want is something where uh, neurons get activated when there's the right pattern as input so that it generates an output that might be indicative of the presence or absence of, of some patterns. Okay, so um, the, the basis of a neural network is, is the node or a unit. And here, um, the network is going to have many units. Now, the units are connected with some links. So here, if each unit is indexed by i, and in fact, if I consider two units, let's say there's a unit i and a unit j, then the link between those two units, I'm going to associate a weight with that link. 
So the idea is that the weight is going to scale up or down the numerical signal, which is going to essentially allow some propagation that is not just you know, uh, transferring a numerical signal, but, but you know, changing it. Uh, concretely, what we're going to do with those weights is to compute a linear combination of the inputs. So if I've got some inputs, xi, and now I can take a linear combination with some weights, wji, add to this a constant w0, and then produce um, a new signal, aj. Now this new signal is not quite yet the output. The idea is that to make our neural network be able to compute a wide variety of things, we'll want to make sure that it's not just a linear function, but that there's something nonlinear as well. So here we introduce an activation function h. So I guess in the context of neural networks, here h denotes um, an activation function. So we saw earlier that h was a hypothesis, but in this context it's, it's an activation function. And it takes as input aj, and then it will change it in a nonlinear way to produce yj. So, so yeah, so together you see you've got a linear combination that we pass through a nonlinear function that produces the output, and this is what every node in a network more or less does. Okay, so let's draw a picture to illustrate a bit more concretely how this computation takes place. Okay, so here's a node, and um, this node will receive some inputs. So let's say my inputs are 1, x1, x2, x3. And then each one of those inputs is going to be rescaled with a weight, uh, w, j0, w, j1, w, j2, and w, j3. Okay, so these here are the input links. And what happens is that the first thing that the node will do is take a linear combination of the inputs according to the weights. So here let me denote by a sum the fact that we essentially compute, um, we compute aj um, equal to the sum with respect to i of w, j, i, x, i. Okay, so after we compute a linear combination, then we apply our activation function. So here, let me denote the activation function by a, a curved line here that indicates that this is something nonlinear. So this is our activation function h. So we're going to compute h of aj. OK, and then this produces an output that is then passed along to the next nodes in the network. So here we've got the output links. Okay, so this is just one node. The idea is that we're going to connect many nodes like this, right? So the outputs of one node are going to connect to the inputs of some other nodes, and this way we can construct an interesting network with um, many nodes. And then all the links will have some weights. So here I'm only putting weights on the input links because the output links are really going to be input links to the next node. And, and that's where I'm going to put the weights, right? But in, uh, otherwise, there are some weights as well here. 
And then again, the main thing is that, generally speaking, we can think of the, the unit as computing uh, a nonlinear function of a linear combination of the inputs based on the weights that we have here. Okay, any questions regarding this picture? Perfect. Okay, let's continue. Oh, yes, one question. So the input also can be a nonlinear function or as this Right, okay, so the inputs themselves might be like really the input to our problem or they could be inputs of previous nodes and there um, if they come from previous nodes, then they will have gone through an activation function there that is likely to be nonlinear too. Okay. So the inputs can be also file effects similar. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So before we talked about how we could um, map, um, I guess, our um, inputs to a new space. Uh, in the context of neural networks, we generally won't have to do this. And what we're going to see is that this mapping to get into a new space could correspond essentially to the first layer of the network or, or like the, the first part of the network. So traditional methods would often require somebody to come up with basis functions to do this transformation. With neural networks, instead, we simply design an architecture and the idea is that part of the, the network is going to learn as well how to remap the inputs into a new, new space. Okay, so as I was explaining, the uh, activation function is generally going to be nonlinear. Um, if we don't have any activation function, right, or if it's just the identity activation function, then it means that what we're currently computing is going to be linear. And then if we just have something linear, it's not going to be very expressive. Uh, so that's why we, we, we need nonlinear activation functions. And now, early on, the interpretation that um, scientists were looking for in terms of what this activation function could do is to essentially do something similar to firing that um, real neurons would do. And here we can think of firing as essentially when a unit gets activated and then outputs something that would be near one. So we could think of the output of one as essentially when it fires. And then um, if the output is not activated, uh, perhaps because uh, when we feed it with some inputs, it's like the wrong pattern and then it won't fire. So if it doesn't fire, then we can think of it as producing an output that is near zero. So this is a, a simple interpretation. Now today, um, we don't have to design units that, that do this per se, so they can essentially compute anything. But early on, in terms of um, trying to mimic the brain, then this was some, some desirable property. Okay, so let me draw examples for two important activation functions. Uh, the first one is what we're going to call the thresholding activation function. And then the next one, sigmoid, we've already seen it. So we've actually seen it twice already. Uh, once as um, a posterior distribution, another time as a basis function. And now we're seeing it as an activation function. So the sigmoid function, as you can see, is quite popular. Okay, so the threshold activation function, um, here let's have aj and then h of aj. Um, so this will be a function that essentially returns zero when the input is negative, then there's a step, and then it returns one when the output is positive. Okay, and now, 
AJ, again, is the sum over I of WJI times XI plus WJ0. OK, this is a thresholding function. And then the sigmoid function Okay, so the sigmoid function, we've already seen it before. It starts near zero, it rises, crosses at 0 0.5, and then asymptotically approaches one. So you'll notice that we can think of the sigmoid function here as really just being a smooth version of the trash holding function. So the trash holding function is great whenever we want to have outputs that are zero or one, and then here it will output zero whenever we've got something negative, and then it outputs 1 when it's positive, right? Uh, but now we'll see in a moment that the problem with this function is that it's not um, a smooth and continuous function. So if we want to compute the gradient and use gradient-based methods or continuous optimization, uh, we're going to have a problem, right? So, so there's, there's, there's a discontinuity at 0. In contrast, the sigmoid function is nice and smooth. It has more or less the same shape. Um, and, and then we can, in fact, adjust the slope as well so that it, it can approximate arbitrarily closely um, the, the, the step function that's thresholding. Okay, so with this, um, if we consider, let's say, thresholding activation functions, now, an interesting question is, can we design nodes in our neural network that will essentially compute uh, an output that is 0 or 1 that could correspond to a logical formula? Uh, the idea is that the computer, at, at its most basic level, right, is a bunch of gates, and everything that it computes is a logical formula, right? So it outputs zeros or 1 based on, on some inputs, and, and everything in there is really just a complex logical formula. So, so now with this, um, if we want to have a neural network that, can, that is going to be expressive and perhaps can compute the same things that uh, classic computers uh, just based on gates would compute, then is there a way for us to design some units that would also uh, correspond to some of the basic gates like the AND gate, the OR gate, and then the NOT gate, right? So, any logical formula, any Boolean function, right, can be expressed as a combination of AND, OR, and NOT gates. So, so what we're going to do now is draw um, a unit that can emulate the AND gate, same thing for the OR gate, and same thing for the NOT gate. OK, so if I consider first the end gate, so here's a unit that has a thresholding activation function. I'm going to give it three inputs, 1, x1, and x2, with weights w0, w1, and w2. And here, if I want to emulate an end gate, um, we need to consider whenever x1 and x2 are zeros and ones. Okay, so if I have x1 and x2, then here I would get 0, 0, 0, 1. And now the question is, is it possible to come up with some weights that would allow me, if I feed some values for x1 and x2 that are either 0, 1, to get an output here that would correspond to the end of x1 and x2. So can anybody suggest here some weights 
that would allow me to emulate the end gate so that this truth table would emerge naturally. Yes. Multiply x1 by x2. Um, right, okay, so yes, generally speaking, if, uh, if we're disregarding this architecture, uh, we could simply multiply x1 by x2, and then we would get precisely this truth table. But now, you see, I want to get something similar to what I drew here, where I, I have a linear combination of the inputs, then I apply the thresholding function, and I want to produce uh, this truth table. So I'm, I'm looking for weights. Well, okay, yes. Okay, so minus one, here plus one, and here plus one. So let's see what happens. So if we look at the first row, everything is zero. So I'm going to have here minus one plus zero plus zero. So this is going to give me minus one. And then um, the thresholding function essentially returns zero when the output is negative. So this works. Um, Okay, so the second row will work too, so I'm going to have here minus 1 plus 0 plus 1. Um, actually, no, does this work? So, okay, yeah, if we have minus 1 plus 0 plus 1, then we get 0. And now, this is a little bit tricky because uh, we are at uh, the discontinuity, right? And then at 0, it depends how we define things, so we could decide that it always gives us 0 back or that it always gives us 1. But can anybody suggest maybe a small tweak to those weights so that we would not be at the discontinuity? And then for this case, we could fix that. Yes? So minus 1.5. Good. OK, so here, so it, it still works for the first row. So second row, we're going to have minus 1.5 plus 0 plus 1, negative. Therefore, it produces 0. Same thing for the third row. And then for the last row, Minus 1.5 plus 1 plus 1, it's positive, so then it produces 1. So this works. Very good. Okay, we can also consider the OR gate. And then, again, there's a truth table with x1 and x2, and here x1 or x2. And in this case, we're going to have 0, 1, 1, 1. Can anybody suggest some weights here to emulate the OR gate? Yes. Just change which W? W naught. W naught to? Uh, negative 0 0.5. OK. Minus 0 0.5. And here this would still be 1. And this could still be 1. So if we check, so we're going to have here minus 0 0.5 plus 0 plus 0, which is negative, gives us 0. Perfect. Then. Uh, minus 0 0.5 plus 0 plus 1, that's positive. It gives us 1. And then all the others will also give us something positive. So this works. Perfect. OK, the last gate, the NOT gate. So this one, we're just going to have two inputs, 1 and x1 two weights, w0, w1, and then our truth table is much simpler. Okay. Can anybody suggest some weights for this one? One for one and minus two for each one. One here and and minus 2 for w1. OK, so if we feed in 0, this is 1 plus 0 
it's positive, returns 1. If we feed in 1, uh, so this is 1 minus 2, negative, produces 0. Perfect. OK, very good. So you see, now we've designed three types of units, right? And just by changing the weights, right, we can emulate the AND, the OR, and the NOT, which allows us to now com combine together uh, these gates, uh, these units, so that we can approximate any Boolean function. OK, so when it comes to networks, there's lots of architectures that we can consider. In fact, we're going to see in uh, the following lectures uh, different interesting architectures. But generally speaking, there's two broad classes. Uh, the first class is known as feed-forward neural networks because the network is an acyclic directed graph. So it starts with the inputs, then we propagate the inputs through the nodes layer by layer, and then there's some output eventually, and then everything flows in one direction. The other type of network are recurrent networks, and these are um, quite interesting because they give us some uh, new properties. Uh, so for instance, they are quite popular in natural language processing uh, simply because we often have inputs of varying length. So we don't have a vector x of a fixed length. So if you think of a sentence where every word could correspond to part of uh, the vector x, now the more words you have in a sentence, perhaps the longer should be the input. And, and then a recurrent neural network will be nice for this because it will be a, a network that is cyclic, so we'll be able to essentially have um, part of the network handle like one word and then go back and then handle the second word and, and so on. And, and then so we'll be able to use a cyclic part to adapt to the lens that, that we need. Another nice property is that we can use them to memorize information and then we can think of them as a different type of, of dynamical system. Okay, so for now, let's focus with feed-forward neural networks. Later in the course, we're going to talk as well about recurrent neural networks. Uh, so I'm going to draw a simple feed-forward neural network um, that has simply uh, two input units, one hidden layer, and, and also one output unit. Okay, so I'm going to denote by squares my two inputs. Then I have a hidden layer um, with two units, and then an output right here. And let's add some connections. And then with each connection, I have a weight. And here you'll notice that my weights, I index them with the unit that it's going to reach followed by the unit that it came from, okay? So this is a, a normal convention. And the idea is that you see, if I look at all the connections between two layers, um, I could organize them into a matrix, right? That would correspond here to four entries. Um, so here we would have um, essentially 1, 2 versus 3, 4. So I would have W, 3, 1. Um, then W, 4, 1. Um, W, 3, 2. And W, 4, 2. Actually, did I do this reversed? Yeah, I should, I should do it the other way around. Um, 
Well, okay, in any case, here what happens is that um, I have essentially the, the first row that corresponds to the first input, uh, the second row that corresponds to the second input, and then the first column that corresponds to this output, and then this column for this output. Okay, so in general, this is why we often represent weights as matrices in neural networks because when you put together all the weights between two layers, you can organize them as a matrix. Okay, so now if we look at perhaps one of the simplest type of neural network, um, it was called in the early days, so this was several decades ago, a perceptron. And then a perceptron is essentially just a single layer feedforward neural network. And then when I say single layer, we typically count as, as layers just the, the hidden and output layer. So the inputs, um, there's no computation happening here, so it's, these are just the inputs. And then the computation will happen at the outputs here, so it's really just one layer of computation. Um, now in this picture, I've got four, no, sorry, five inputs, three outputs. Um, the, the fact that some of them are white versus black could simply indicate that we have different values. So perhaps black could be a high value, white could be a low value. And then same thing for the outputs. So we've got different uh, shades of gray that could indicate um, the magnitude of, of the outputs. And then some of these edges are thicker than others. And this could simply indicate that we have weights that are higher in, in magnitude as well. Okay? But this is just an illustration. So the point is that um, the perceptron, our simplest type of neural network, is really just has one layer of computation that corresponds to the output layer. All right, so we're now ready to talk about algorithms to train neural networks. And then so we're going to start by seeing how we can train a perceptron. And then over the next few lectures, we're also going to see how we can train uh, more complex types of neural networks. OK, so if we're in a supervised learning setting, it means that we have both the input x and the output y as part of our training set. And now we're trying to uh, learn the weights that will allow us to compute as accurately as possible y. So um, I guess, yeah, the, the key now is how are we going to adjust the weights? And let's see now a, a simple algorithm for threshold perceptrons. OK, so a threshold perceptron, it means that every computational unit is using the thresholding function as the activation function. And it turns out here that we can have a very simple algorithm that will simply include one loop um, to adjust the weights. Now, the way we're going to proceed is that even though the perceptron has multiple outputs, we're going to train each output separately. So in the context of a perceptron, really, um, if I go back, um, you see this unit has some weights that correspond to the edges here. But those edges right, are all independent of the edges of the second unit and, and different from the third unit. So in the case of a perceptron, I can train each output unit independently. So I'm going to essentially describe the algorithm for each output unit separately. So for each output unit j, what we're going to do is go through our data set one data point at a time, so one x, y pair at a time, and then we're going to check which case applies to this data point. So one possibility is that the data point, we already are producing the right output, um, so here, okay, in, in this case for the perceptron, uh, I should mention that I'm, I'm assuming that the output is going to be either 0 or 1, because if I'm using a thresholding function, right, the thresholding function is, can only output 0 or 1. So this would be appropriate in the case where we're doing classification, 
Let's say I've got two classes. One of them corresponds to class zero. The other one corresponds to class one. Or the other possibility is that I've got a Boolean function. And then this function, again, outputs just zero or one. Uh, we're going to relax this later, but for now, because we're working with the thresholding activation function, that's what's possible. Okay, so here I'm assuming that y is essentially either 0 or 1. And now if, it, um, if for, for the input x, the, the computation that I would do is correct, so let's say that it, it computes the right y, then I guess I don't have to change anything. I can just keep the weights the way they are. Now, what if the output is incorrect? What if I produce a zero, but instead the correct output would be a one? So now I need to change the weights, and what I'm going to do is apply a very, very simple rule, and the rule is I'm going to add the input x to my weights, and that's it. Okay, I'm gonna explain in a moment why that works, but that's, that's a very simple update rule that I can apply. And then the third case is, what if it's incorrect and I produce one for the output, but the correct answer is zero. So now I'm going to adjust my weights and I'm going to adjust them simply by subtracting the input x. Okay, so here the perception algorithm is extremely simple, right? So either it's correct, we do nothing, or it's incorrect, and then we add the weight or we subtract the weight from the inputs. Okay, and then the beauty of this is that yeah, there, there's no math really, right? So this is it, the, this is the algorithm. Okay, now let's see why this works. So um, the perceptual learning algorithm, um, because it, it deals, I guess, with um, units that are computing a linear function that is passed through a threshold, the idea is that the thresholding function returns one when the linear combination is positive and it returns zero when it's negative. So here, we'll take advantage of the fact that when I take a dot product of any vector x by itself, I always get something positive. Okay, so x here corresponds to my inputs. If I simply take the dot product of x by itself, right, then it, it necessarily gives me something positive. And then if I negate that, obviously I'll get something negative. So now, if uh, my perceptron computes an output that is one, that's because when I take the linear combination, it, it is positive. And then if it outputs zero, it's because the linear combination is negative. So now, if the output should be one, but instead it's zero, then what I need to do uh, is to essentially increase this linear combination, right? Because um, if the input, sorry, if, if the output is currently zero, it means that I got a linear combination that's negative, but I'd like to get an output that is one, so I'd like to make my linear combination positive, so I need to increase my linear combination. And one way of doing this is simply to add x to the weights, so Afterwards, my new weight is just w plus x, and then when I multiply that by x, this is my linear combination, right? Then I'll get w transpose times x plus x transpose x. And then we just saw that x transpose x is positive, so therefore this expression is greater than the original linear combination. Right, so you see the key here is that we're adding x to the weights because when we do that, right, then the new weight is going to be such that its linear combination with x will now be greater than before, and, and therefore I have a better chance that now instead of producing a zero, I might produce a one because my linear combination might go from negative to positive. I mean, it's possible that it's still gonna remain negative, but then this is just one update, and we're gonna do many of those updates. Now, if we have the opposite, where the output should be zero, but instead it's one, then what we do is we subtract x, because this way, my linear combination is going to decrease um, with the new weight. So the new weight, w minus x, transpose times x, will be smaller than the original linear combination. So now, um, if it used to be positive, 
then there's a chance that this will become negative and there's a chance that we're going to output 0 instead of 1. Okay, any questions regarding this? Yeah. Isn't that like gradient descent? Ah, very good question, yeah. So is this like gradient descent? So in fact, we're going to see that indeed this algorithm can be thought as gradient descent. And, and I'll show you now on, on the next few slides mathematically that it is indeed equivalent. Okay, so... Um, we could, instead of applying the perceptron algorithm as it is, right, then we've seen that a lot of algorithms with our, the different models that we've seen, um, we can optimize the weights by doing some form of gradient descent. So, so here, let's see what happens if we apply gradient descent to this problem. Um, okay, so here it's a little bit tricky because the thresholding function is not a function that is continuous, but still what we can do is think of our problem as follows. Let's define a loss function that will correspond to the misclassification error. And here our misclassification error, what I'm going to do is for every data point x and y, um, I'm going to determine that it is misclassified whenever its product of y, w transpose x is negative. The, the, the reason for this is that W transpose X is the linear combination. If that is positive, then um, it should return 1. But now, um, well, okay, actually, in, in this formulation, I, I should mention that um, I'm going to assume now that Y is either plus 1 or minus 1. So this is just a, a relabeling, if you want, of, of the classes. Okay, that's going to be mathematically convenient. So, so far, whenever we wanted to have mathematical convenience, we were using y that was either 0 or 1. But, but um, in, in this particular formulation, I'm going to use 1 and minus 1. And, and this is just a relabeling for mathematical convenience. Okay, so with this, now, if, uh, when I look at the linear combination, if a point is supposed to be part of the class that's labeled 1, when I multiply W transpose X, um, I would expect this to be positive if it's part of class 1. And then when I multiply by Y, which is 1, then it will be positive. But if it's misclassified, then I will get here something that is negative times Y. And then uh, since Y is 1, then this will be negative. Okay, so, so this is for points of class 1. For points of class minus 1, then um, I have a similar reasoning. So here, W transpose X should be negative, but if it's misclassified, it'll be positive, times Y that is minus one, so therefore it's, it's negative. So this is a simple test to check which points are misclassified. So beyond just being a simple test, it also tells us by how much those points are misclassified, because um, if something should be positive but it's negative, then I can look at how, what's the magnitude of, of the negative part and then treat this as, as part of our error. So here, um, you see, this will tell us if it's misclassified and also by how much. And now what I can do is simply add up all of those terms for the misclassified points and then this gives me now an objective that I can try to minimize. So minimizing this will gradually make um, our perceptron more and more accurate. Okay, so let's use this objective. And here, uh, maybe what's a little bit um, not obvious is that I'm, I'm going to use this objective only with respect to the points that are misclassified. So here M denotes the set of points that are misclassified. And the intuition is that um, what I could do is simply say that if a point is correctly classified, then there's no error, and therefore the loss here would be zero, so it doesn't appear in, in this expression. Okay? So it's a special loss function where it just happens to be zero. So, so then I just need to worry about the misclassified points, and that's what I obtain here. Okay, so then with respect to this objective, now I can compute the gradient. 
Um, so take the partial derivative with respect to w, and then I'll get a gradient here, um, and then I can take a step in the opposite direction of the gradient, so the negated gradient, where I'm using eta to denote the step length, or if you prefer, the learning rate. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. Now, the gradient happens to be this expression, right? So we had y, w transpose x, but once we take the gradient with respect to w, then it, it just disappears, and, and then we get, we're left with this expression. Now, if instead of really just taking a step in the direction of the gradient with respect to the entire data set, I decide, let's take a step in the direction of the gradient with respect to one point at a time, so I'm going to do some form of a sequential gradient descent, then I can update my weights by just adding a step length times y x bar, which corresponds to one term here, which is the gradient for one data point. Right? But then I'm going to do this for every data point one after the other, so it's sequential gradient descent. And then if I also assume that my step length, eta, is 1, then I recover the threshold perceptron algorithm. Okay, so, so that's how we can think of the perceptron learning algorithm and the rules that we saw as some form of gradient descent with respect to the objective that I described. And here it's gradient descent, but we have to do it sequentially one point at a time. Any questions regarding this? Okay, very good. All right, so now let's discuss a little bit what happens when we apply this algorithm. All right, so the algorithm um, right here, so this was our algorithm, there's a loop, and then it says we're going to do this until all correct outputs um, are obtained for all training instances. So in general, uh, the algorithm will work in a sense that it will eventually correctly classify everything as long as our data is linearly separable. Okay, so here the, I've got a theorem that um, essentially states this more formally. So the threshold perception learning algorithm converges if and only if the data is linearly separable. If it's not linearly separable, we're going to be into this loop forever, and then we're never going to reach a point where everything is perfectly classified. OK, the reason why um, here we need the data to be linearly separable is because when we look at the, the rule for the perceptron classifier, um, we can see that it's, it's really a, um, a linear classifier, so a linear separator, because we have w transpose x. So the idea is that when w transpose x is greater than 0, we assign class 1. When it's less than 0, we assign minus 1. So really, w transpose x acts as this linear separator between the two classes. Okay, and now when I say linearly separable, um, just to make sure everyone understands, I'm going to draw a picture for an example of a data set that's linearly separable, and then another data set that is not linearly separable. Okay, so for linearly separable, so let's say that we've got data from one class that corresponds to those dots, another class that corresponds to those crosses, and now it should be clear that I can draw a line between the two, and therefore it's linearly separable. If it's non-linearly separable, then there's a simple example 
where I've got four data points, um, two data points in one class uh, that correspond to the crosses, the other two that correspond to uh, the two dots. And here you can try to write a line that could separate the crosses from the dots. And doesn't matter how long you try, it's not going to be possible, right? So if I draw a line here, it's clear that I have the pluses on one side, but then there's a dot on each side. So this doesn't work, right? And then if I draw a line this way instead, then it's the same problem. Now I have a plus on each side, so it doesn't work, right? And then you can try something fancy where maybe you um, simply draw the line that goes through a data point. Okay, splitting it in half is not going to help. Okay, it's still you still have half of the data point on, on that side, and and then another data point on that side. So so basically you can't. So so you can prove that it's impossible mathematically to separate such a data set. So last class. Um, I introduced um, the perceptual algorithm, and then we saw the perceptual algorithm in the context of uh, the threshold activation function. And one of the conclusion was that when we use the thresholding function, then we end up with a linear separator uh, between two classes. So if we have two classes, right, then whenever our input w transpose x gives us something positive, then it's going to be one class. And then whenever it gives us something negative, it's the other class. And then because w transpose x is a linear function, as a result, the separator is linear. So now an interesting question is, well, what if we choose a different type of activation function? Could we obtain a different type of separator, perhaps something nonlinear? And in particular, what's tempting is to say, well, how about the logistic sigmoid? Right? So I've got here on this slide an example of the logistic sigmoid in 3D, so with two inputs and then the output. So it shows how the class would rise from, uh, well, the, the prediction would rise from a probability of 0 to a probability of 1 by essentially going up a cliff, right? So that's the shape of, of the logistic sigmoid. And clearly, this is a function that is nonlinear. But on the other hand, if we think about it, what defines really the boundary between one class and the other is going to be whether we think of um, the probability as being greater than 0.5 or less than 0.5. So essentially, when we look at the logistic sigmoid here, then there is, in the middle of the cliff, um, a line that we could draw that would correspond to probability 0.5 for each class. And then this line is essentially, again, a linear separator. So here, this is a little bit counterintuitive, but even if the logistic sigmoid is a nonlinear function, right? This is just a nonlinear function of the, the output probability. But in terms of classification, when we decide that um, we switch from one class to another at probability 0.5, well, the line where probability 0.5 is is essentially a straight line uh, right in the middle of the cliff here. So it will still be a linear separator. So, so then um, this is interesting because, well, I guess um, it is somewhat expected if uh, the logistic sigmoid is really an approximation, a smooth version of the thresholding function, then you would uh, expect the same type of properties. And maybe the only difference is just that now we can say that, OK, beyond just having a, a separator at 0.5, we also have probabilities that can be used to estimate our level of confidence in each class. OK, so that's the main difference. But otherwise, it still gives us a linear separator. So from that perspective, then um, whenever we work with sigmoid perceptrons, we end up with a hypothesis space that is the same as logistic regression. In fact, you see this curve is the same as what we saw for logistic regression, right? Because the probability of the output is, is again, something smooth that, that rises from 0 to 1. OK, so let's say that we want to work with um, 
the logistics sigma it for the deactivation function in the case of the perceptron, then the next question is how do we train the, the, the powders, the weights of the perceptron for that? So uh, the update rules that we saw for the thresholding activation function do not necessarily apply here. And, and then the question is, what, what can we do? So the general approach will always be the same, that we want to define some objective. And, and then a natural one here could just be to minimize the squared error. So I've got the output of my logistic sigmoid. Um, this is the target. And perhaps all I can do is just minimize the difference, in fact, the square difference. And, and then this will um, uh, essentially reduce errors over time. So this is from the perspective of optimization. So we, we can do this. Um, now, because the logistic sigmoid perception also outputs a probability, we can also do maximum likelihood. We can do maximum a posteriori learning. And we can also do Bayesian learning. Now, if we do maximum likelihood, what's really interesting is that the algorithm is essentially the same as logistic regression. So when we talked about logistic regression, right, we had an output that was also the sigmoid like this. And then we interpreted the output as, as a probability. And, and then we wanted to maximize the probability of, of that class for, for all the inputs. And, and then doing this by essentially choosing the W that maximizes this probability is the same as what we would do here. So this is where we can say that uh, the perceptron with a logistic sigmoid activation function is really equivalent to logistic regression when we view it from a statistical perspective and, and we're simply maximizing likelihood. Now, when we minimize squared error, the algorithm is going to be different. And now we're going to see on the next slides how to derive it. Um, but I, I should also mention that we can also consider, again, maximum posterior and Bayesian learning. But for the purpose of the course, we're going to stick to the first two. OK, so if we're minimizing squared error, then uh, the, a natural thing to do will be to uh, figure out what is our gradient. Now, again, because there's a sigmoid, we won't be able to isolate the weights by setting the gradient to 0. Um, so we'll, we'll have to essentially just take steps in the direction of the gradient. And um, here's what the gradient looks like. Right? So if you take the expression from the previous slide and calculate the gradient, so the partial derivative with respect to each weight, then you would get a summation like this. And now uh, the error with respect to each data point n will have um, this, this expression for the derivative. And how the derivative of the sigmoid, if you recall, is simply the sigmoid times 1 minus the sigmoid. So we end up with this expression. And, and again, it should be clear that here, this is not something easy to, to solve. Like isolating w out of this expression is not something easy. Uh, at least we don't have a closed form solution for that. So what we're going to do again is just take steps in the direction of the gradient. OK, so if we take steps in the direction of the gradient, we can take steps with respect to the entire data set, or we can take steps with respect to just one data point. And what is actually common in practice is to just do it with respect to one data point or a mini batch of data points. And this leads to a form of, of sequential gradient descent. So here, the algorithm would be very simple. So we repeat this loop, where for every data point, we compute the error. So the error here is just the difference between um, the output and the target. Um, and then we compute the derivative. And then we simply take a step in the direction of the gradient. Okay, so, so it's as simple as that. And then we repeat this many times until some stopping criterion. So this could be that we have a bounded amount of time, so we just stop when time is up. Or otherwise, we can stop when um, the, the weights don't change very much. Okay. Um, now, in this algorithm, you'll notice that we have eta, which is a, a parameter that corresponds to the learning rate. And then here, this is going to be something critical. So the learning rate defines the step size um, if effectively for, for gradient descent. Uh, so we're going to come back to this in, in, in a few slides. Um, but then 
Yeah, this is an important parameter that would often have to be tweaked. Okay, any questions regarding this algorithm? Okay, very good. All right, so now we've seen how we can um, optimize a perceptron um, with two types of activation function, but then in both cases, even in the case when we use the sigmoid activation function, the separator for classification is a linear separator. So, so here, um, this arises in part because we just have one layer of neurons in our network, but then today uh, what is quite popular is to consider multiple layers. And now an interesting question is what can we represent, what type of functions could we represent if we have multiple layers? And the answer is that it turns out that with multiple layers, in fact, as soon as we have two layers, if we have enough neurons in our network, we can demonstrate that we can approximate any function arbitrarily closely. Now to understand this, um, I've got a few slides that illustrate the type of functions that we can construct whenever we start composing different neurons together. So here as, as a start, let's say that we have two sigmoid units and these sigmoid units, let's say that they are parallel and now we, um, uh, they're parallel but then they have opposite cliffs so that then when we add them together, they essentially form a ridge. So I'm going to draw this on, on the board, but essentially we will end up with a ridge uh, like this in, in one dimension. <coughs> okay, so let's say we've got one sigmoid that rises like that. Let's say we've got a second sigmoid that decreases like that. So now if I add those two functions, then I will end up with a ridge that rises and comes down again. Okay, so you see there's a section roughly where both sigmoids are high and then elsewhere there's only one of the sigmoids that, that is high, so then when we add them together, we end up with a ridge. Okay? So here, the idea is that there is a, a corresponding architecture where we would have um, a sigmoid activation function for one neuron and then a second neuron. So, so this would be the first neuron here, this is a second neuron here, and then I can add them together. So I'm going to put some weights of one. And let's use the identity activation function. So if I add them together with weights of one, then it's like adding those two curves that gives me this nice ridge. And, and then in multiple dimensions, this corresponds to what I have on the screen. Okay, we don't have to stop here, so constructing a ridge is, is interesting in itself, but not too exciting yet. So now what if we take two ridges and we essentially intersect them by adding them and then thresholding. So if we have two ridges that are perpendicular, so I've got one ridge in one dimension, another ridge in the other dimension, I add them together so that, uh, and, and then after that I, I, I threshold such that there's only the part where the two ridges intersect that would remain, then I can produce essentially a bump. Okay, so, so here I can construct another surface that will be a bump, and the idea is that this is interesting because now let's say that I would like to have a function that perhaps uh, assigns points to one class in just one tiny region, then I can create a bump for that region, and then everywhere else would be for the other class. Okay? So just to illustrate, let me draw what would be the corresponding network. So here we would have again some sigmoid units. So I'm going to use four. Okay, and then I create a ridge with the identity 
So this is our first ridge. This is our second ridge. And then I combine them again by adding them together. And now let me use a thresholding function. Okay. So with this construction, then I'll be able to essentially just get a bump and then everywhere else will be zero. Okay, and then I can make my bump smooth if I wish to by replacing the thresholding by a sigmoid as well. Okay, so once we can create bumps like this, now if I have an arbitrary function, and let's say I'm doing regression, what I could do is approximate my function arbitrarily closely, and here could be any function, I could approximate it arbitrarily closely by essentially tiling bumps, bumps that would be very, very thin and very close to each other up to the right height so that it approximates any curve. So okay, let me draw this as well. So let's say I've got a function that looks like this. This is an arbitrary function. And let's say that I'm doing regression, so I would like to approximate this function. And now the question is, can I get a neural network to learn this function? So the answer is that I could create bumps that are very thin of the right height. And then if I tile them like this, so that they're really close to each other, then I can approximate my function arbitrarily closely all the way like this everywhere. Okay, so you see if I make those bumps the right height and I make them thin enough and then I tile them, so essentially I add them, but they're each responsible for just a tiny part of the space, right, then when I add up all of those little bumps, it would give me a nice smooth function that matches or otherwise approximates arbitrarily closely whatever function I'm trying to learn. Okay, so I guess this is an intuitive proof for how we can approximate any function arbitrarily closely with a neural network. And it turns out that we can do this with neural networks as long as they have at least two layers. So one hidden layer, one output layer. And here there has to be enough um, hidden units. Um, and, and then if, if there's enough of them, there could be infinitely many of them, then I can make my bumps arbitrarily, well, uh, yeah, as, as thin as possible. And then I'll get my approximation. Any questions regarding this? Yeah. Oh, so identity simply means here that we don't have any activation function, so we simply return as output whatever was the input. So here you see I'm going to take the sum of this sigmoid plus this sigmoid, and then I don't uh, use any activation function per se, I just return the sum. That's what the identity means. OK, so this is great. Um, now the next question, obviously, is if I can approximate arbitrary functions, well, can I train a neural net to eventually get to approximate arbitrary functions? Right. So I'm going to need, presumably, some um, uh, quite powerful algorithm to do this. Um, it, so here, one algorithm that is quite popular is the backpropagation algorithm. Backpropagation is a name that stands for the following idea that we can uh, simply start with a network, compute its output, and compare that to our target in, in our data. And then the errors that would uh, be between what it produces as output and the target, now we can back propagate that through the network in order to compute a gradient or a partial derivative with respect to each weight and then update the weights accordingly. Okay, so, so the backpropagation algorithm is essentially a form of gradient descent, but it's a form of gradient descent that is efficient in the sense that it will take advantage of the structure of the network to compute all of the partial derivatives simultaneously. 
right? Because the natural thing to do would be to say, for every weight, let's figure out what is the partial derivative, compute that, then update, and then take the next weight, do the same thing. But that, that could take a, a long time if for every weight we have to do some computation with respect to the entire network. But it turns out that we can get the partial derivatives for all of the weights simultaneously in essentially a, a, a constant number of passes through the network. And then the backpropagation algorithm uh, will do this. OK, so neural networks uh, have become quite popular over the years. And then I'm sure all of you have heard a lot about them. Uh, some of the success stories often are related with speech recognition. So we'll see later in the course how in, in 2009 there was a major breakthrough based on neural networks for speech recognition. Uh, today, machine translation and word embeddings, also the state of the art, is based on, on neural networks. In computer vision, whether we're talking about object recognition or more generally tasks like autonomous driving, again, uh, neural networks have become the state of the art. So there's lots of applications, and then it's in part because they're quite versatile and quite powerful and also quite efficient.